In this lecture, we will discuss some of the history behind the scientific advancements that took place between the 1800s and the uh, mid-1900s that have led to the conclusion that greenhouse gases, or GHGs, are leading to global warming and global climate change. The first major discussion of greenhouse gases came from a scientist named Jean-Baptiste Joseph Fourier, and that was in the 1820s. He was a French mathematician and physicist, and he proposed that greenhouse gases are able to trap solar heat that has been absorbed by the atmosphere, so all the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, and then also they can trap heat that gets radiated back from the surface of Earth. So some of this heat gets um, radiated or emitted by the surface and gets reabsorbed by the atmosphere, and some of it goes directly into space. And so those are that's dependent on our greenhouse gases, which are in our atmosphere. The first, um, the first major discussion about uh, some of these theories actually came from Jean-Pierre Paradin, and I am so sorry if I'm mangling these names. Um, he was not a scientist, but he noticed that there was um, some out-of-place boulders perched high in the sides of mountains. So here's a picture of some of these observations he made where they, had, they have these boulders that just don't look like they fit in with the rest of the rocks around them. And he wondered, he wondered how did how did these boulders get here, and why do they not look like the other ones? And he, he hypothesized rocks can't float, we know that, so they couldn't have gotten there from the rising flood, from floodwaters. And then he also noticed markings on the rocks, and that is not easy to see in this picture, but there are markings on the rocks in lines, and he observed these markings, and he said, well, these markings look a lot like rocks that I've seen at the ends of glaciers, in other areas where there's glaciers. And so he wondered, was there enough, what, did there used to be glaciers here that would push these rocks up onto these other uh, mountains and um, cause these lines to form on the rocks? So I'd like to include this slide and in our discussion of Jean-Pierre Paradine because he was not a scientist, and yet he used scientific observations to make a large discovery that eventually led to the creation of a new field of science. And so I hope that inspires some of you to think that maybe you are not a science major, but you may be able to make discoveries in your future. So after Paradine uh, made these discoveries, he talked to everyone he could talk he could talk to, and finally he got some folks to listen to him, and this created a domino effect. So he talked to Ignace Venetz, who was a naturalist, and this gentleman convinced Jean de Charpentier, who then told Louis Agassiz. And Agassiz took these observations and he essentially ran with them and proposed a bunch of, uh, of theories. So first he said, well, I propose that there was an ice age in the past that during which time glaciers extended from the North Pole and in, down into North America and Europe. And he first presented this theory at a meeting of the Swiss Society of Natural Sciences in 1837, and it got a very chilly reception. I'm sorry, it's a bad pun. Um, eventually, though, these scientists were able to win over the scientific community as they collected more and more evidence from the mountains of Switzerland. And this led to the birth of a new field of science called paleoclimatology, which is the study of past climates. So after talking to um, So then we see that by, 19, by 1859, the idea of ice ages in the past was beginning to become commonly accepted, and researchers began to build on this theory. Two of these researchers are John Tyndall, he was a British physicist, and in 1859 he proposed that ice ages were caused by a decrease in atmospheric CO2. So he was able to put these two 
variables together, but he proposed that the cause was a decrease in CO2, which led to the ice age. And now we kind of flip those over and say the, the CO2 um, can, can lead to changes in climate. Um, another scientist, Svente Arrhenius, was a, switch, a Swedish physicist and chemist. In 1896, he was able to show calculations um, that predicted a, that a doubling in atmospheric carbon dioxide levels was, would cause temperature increases over time by 5 to 6 degrees. And so he did these calculations, and that was his estimate. Progress did seem to slow as we head into the late 1800s and early 1900s. And of course, there was a lot going on in the world at this time. So this was a big time of industrialization. There were world wars in the um, first half of the 1900s. There's a lot of disease and medical discoveries. But um, the scientific world didn't forget all of these uh, theories and findings. It just took them a while to kind of get back to them. Uh, by 1938, though, people began to examine the effect of industrialization on the climate, and Guy Callender, he was a British engineer and inventor, he suggested that the warming trends that occurred in the 1800s were due to a 10% increase in atmospheric CO2 from burning fossil fuels. So this kind of builds on the information that we saw from previous scientists who had linked these two but had the the cause and effect reverse. And um, his findings weren't very concerning to many people. At the time, people assumed that the oceans could absorb CO2, um, and CO2 would, would be absorbed into the oceans as carbonic acid. Um, but then Hans Seuss, he was an Austrian chemist and physicist, with Roger Revelle, who was an American ocean, oceanographer, they examined the ocean chemical buffering system and they said, well, this buffering system prevents the ocean from holding on to too much carbon dioxide. And so it cannot just absorb unlimited amounts of CO2. There's an equilibrium that we have to consider, and that prevents it from absorbing all of the CO2 as carbonic acid. Okay, so that is the that brings us up to the 60s, and that's more current day science, so we'll save that for another lecture. Thanks.